I just am thank goodness that this was on a Saturday and that he probably got off at Divinity School because of Rosh Hashanah. So welcome, Cornell. It's good to be here, Bruce. Um, I also am uh, delighted that we have uh, with us Reverend Dr. Yolanda uh, Pierce, the Dean of Howard University's Divinity School. Uh, Yolanda has been, the Dean has been an incredible part of the, the Mayor's Interfaith Council and has brought so much uh, to uh, Washington and we're delighted to have her and her insights in this conversation. We welcome you, Dean Pierce. Thank you. It's an honor to be here and Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you. And we also have, uh, I'm really delighted, Reverend Mark Thomas, Senior Pastor of Conti AME Zion Church. And uh, even though one of his couples uh, uh, changed the time, start time for a wedding, Mark is going to be with us as long as he can. But I wanted Mark here because uh, he's in the thick of things and has been a uh, uh, part of the Washington community and serves uh, and has great insight. We're also delighted to have uh, Professor Terrence Johnson uh, from Georgetown University and also Professor Jacques Berlinerblau from Georgetown University. Uh, both have unbelievable credentials that I can't take up the entire time sharing those, but most specifically Terrence and Jacques have taught for the last four years a class on Black Jewish relations um, at Georgetown University. Jacques taught a 10 week class that has um, uh, sparked incredible interest in my own congregation. And uh, they have, I've been privileged to read a phenomenal new book that is about to be published, uh, which will, uh, I believe, add new insight and great understanding as well. In addition, um, I'm going to introduce uh, my co-host on this and co-moderator, Rabbi Shankman, uh, who's been uh, in the forefront of so many social justice issues. Uh, and most specifically, uh, I'm very proud of the work that Rabbi Shankman has done in our local high schools, really bringing this and other issues up to the forefront. And she's going to tell you a little bit later on of some of the things of how she has spent her summer um, uh, doing uh, things. So we're so delighted that everybody has joined us. We're going to get started off uh, with a question that I uh, addressed to the entire panel. Um, what does this moment in time mean to you and your community? Because th this is, and these last six months have been not only accentuated by the pandemic, uh, but perhaps in some ways because of the pandemic, have given us a, uh, a whole different insight. So I'm gonna, uh, let's start, Cornell, if you wanna begin and then we'll move around our screen. Sure, sure. So first of all, let me just uh, begin with a word of appreciation to Rabbi Lustig, uh, President, uh, Director, uh, the uh, co-chairs, uh, Rabbi Shankman, and a word of affection for the congregation, the Washington Hebrew congregation uh, that has extended so much generosity and kindness uh, to me and to my family, uh, certainly to the NAACP and to people all across Washington. And let me just say this uh, in the presence of your rabbi, that you must be among the most learned and engaged congregations that I've seen across the country. And I've had the experience of, of observing congregational leadership and clerical leadership, rabbinic leadership, and you are on the forefront. So it's a, a delight to be here. And I wish everyone a a happy, healthy, sweet, uh, and just new year. So the, the, the rabbi posed a, a question that really speaks to uh, my community, narrowly defined as in African-Americans, but uh, the American community more broadly. Uh, what does this moment mean to us? It, it has been called uh, a reckoning. Uh, it has been called a, a third reconstruction. I would posit that one could uh, call this an uneasy, unsettling, uh, incomplete genesis or founding. And what I mean by that is here we have a moment in our country where we have the most diverse citizenry uh, in our history, reckoning with deep-seated racial fissures and, and, and fault lines uh, represented met metaphorically, emblematically in the death of George Floyd. Of course, that video uh, being pornographically video, being uh, pornographically violent, morally intimate, 
taking place in emotional slow motion uh, catalyzed and, and captivated our country. This is a moment in which we are literally coming to grips with who we are, which is to say, uh, are we a diverse democ democracy in which we embrace uh, everyone? Are we a democracy in which we have room for everyone? Are we a democracy in which we can make amends for the past, uh, reconcile ourselves with the past, even as we embrace the present uh, and the future? And that question has yet to be answered. But I will simply say this, if the question is to be answered, if it is to be answered in, in a way that allows us to be a just community, uh, a community made in God's image, the question will be answered by people of faith. Be clear about this. Uh, it will not be answered uh, principally in the Senate uh, or in the House of Representatives. Uh, I am a lawyer, uh, but I'm also a fourth generation minister. I've litigated cases on behalf of the Justice Department, the Lawyers Committee. Uh, I teach leadership at the Kennedy School, public policy at the Kennedy School. But ultimately, it is my belief that the question of who we are as God's people, as a democracy, as a republic, as a beloved community is ultimately answered by people of faith. And the way, the way we know that is the people who are on the, on the forefront and on the front lines of justice are people of faith, both in the courts and in the streets. And so today's conversation is a beginning conversation. It's an important conversation, but be clear, be clear. This is a conversation that inspires and ignites us uh, and incites us, if you will, to action. Thank you. Um, Mark, I want to get to Reverend Thomas. I want to get to you because I know you're going to have to dance out at some place and uh, make more members of Conti. So uh, uh, what does this moment mean to you and to your community? So, so in communication, when you talk about... Um, uh, your Jahari window and how, how you see yourself and how others see you. For me, um, we know how we see ourselves in the African-American community, but what we see reflected in the media um, and, and on television and in the movies is not reflective of who we are. Uh, I, I came in today wearing uh, this, this uh, uh, necklace that they had on uh, the uh, the movie Black Panther, um, and because there, when you see these positive images of who we are, it it moves us, it 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 it, it excites us. But we're more than just those those images of what we see on television. So what happens is when we see this stuff happening. We have this duplicity that we have to deal with. We have to deal with how it's played out in the, in the black community and how it's played out in the white community. And so uh, we talk about all the time in our community, um, what you say and what you don't say in front of white folks. The, this is the training that, that we have to, have to give our children. All right, now, when you go out here, here's what you have to do. So it's not just with the police, that, that's an exacerbated uh, example of what happens with us. We have to be careful with our diction, how we're perceived, how we dress. Hell, we can't even wear a hoodie <laughs> without uh, looking like uh, we're, we're thugged out according to how people see us. And again, this moment is bigger than how we're seen, but it's how we see ourselves. So now uh, we, at least from my vantage point, see ourselves as taking the reins, trying to to change the narrative of what's happening in America. Uh, my sister works for, she's one of the vice presidents for the National Urban League. And uh, we had the National Black Voter Day uh, yesterday. And one of their mantras was, what happens to us should never be decided without us. And so I think where this moment has us, that encapsulates where this, ha this moment has us. We, as a community have to band together. And as Dr. King said, our fates are inextricably bound, but we have to band together with folks who don't look like us to help to change what's happening to us. Thank you. Um, Jacques, from your perspective, what does this mean in this moment of time? Uh, thank you, Rabbi Shana Tova, to everyone. Um, 
uh, Professor Johnson and I, my colleague Professor Johnson, are, are really uh, grappling with the findings of our book that we've worked on over the last couple of months and years. And Rabbi, in answer to your question, I think we're at an inflection point for true and meaningful dialogue between African Americans and Jewish Americans. This is really the time because the dialogue, I think both of us might concur, I don't want to put words in, in Professor Johnson's mouth, the dialogue has stalled. And if now is not the time, there probably is no time, given the recent events of the last couple of years. So um, I salute all of our previous speakers. Uh, everything they said struck me as eminently wise. Uh, the one quote I want to put on the floor for our discussion is the following. It's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. where he said, it's well known, it is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Uh, a discussion I'd like to begin within the Jewish community and then with our uh, African-American colleagues is about our own congregations and uh, um, the composition and the look of our own congregations and our willingness to welcome folks that might not look like Ashkenazi Jews or uh, white mainstream normal normalized Ashkenazi Jews. This is something I like to start talking about with the congregation. Uh, I think of Sephardic communities, I think of Afro-Jewish communities, which we're studying at Georgetown University. So that's a, a good internal conversation that I'd like to have uh, in the session today and in the coming weeks and months uh, with our interlocutors uh, at these African-American churches. So uh, Happy New Year to all of you, and I'm very, very eager uh, to hear everyone's views. Thank you. Thank you. Yolanda, Dean uh, Pierce, uh, you're in the center of things, uh, teaching at the Divinity School, but also very much a part of our, our city. And what does this moment mean to you and your community? So for me, this is a moment in which we recognize that at best, we always live in tension. And what I mean by tension is, is that as people of faith, we can affirm that we can remake this world. Um, we have a hope that because of what we believe, because of our values, because of our morals, because of our ethics, we can in fact remake this world. But we live with the tension between the possibility and then I wanna suggest the other coin, the other side of that coin, is a historical amnesia. And mm -hmm. what I am concerned with is about this historical amnesia. We have been in these places before. We have seen genocide before. We have seen police brutality before. We have seen the fracturing of democracy before. But we conveniently forget. And that historical amnesia allows what is now taking place to take place. People forget that we've been here before. They also have a certain kind of nostalgia to the past um, that doesn't take into account the various groups and communities who have been marginalized and oppressed and silenced. And so I want to say that for me, both as an African American, um, as a dean of a divinity school, myself as an ordained minister, that this is a moment of real tension. We can remake the world. The power of this is in our hand. Toni Morrison most famously says in um, her Nobel Prize winning uh, speech when she, when she received the Nobel Prize for literature, she's like, the bird is in our hand. So we can change the course of our country, our nation, we can save democracy, but our historical amnesia about the ills of the past, about the very bedrock of institutional racism, which is this country's founding sin, allows us to forget that that's what, where we've come. And so how are we going to live in this space of tension? And I wanna suggest as people of faith, we have a moral obligation now more than ever before to really remake this world. Because if we do not, and if we cannot, we are watching before our very eyes, the end of this democratic experiment. I, I, your words uh, are so beautiful. Just a very quick thing before I call upon Terrence. Um, I watched two re clergy that I respect very much 
and who are role models for me, my own Rabbi Shankman and uh, Bishop Buddy. It wasn't so much how much they cried at Sandy Hook. It was five weeks later when I had conversations with them when they cried about us forgetting. And I'll never forget those moments with Sue and with Bishop Buddy. Terrence, what does this moment mean, Professor Johnson? Uh, thank you, Rabbi, and Happy New Year to everyone. You know, as Jacques and I were sort of finishing up the book, I mean, what kept coming to mind was this idea of bad faith that I learned from my mentor, Lewis Gordon, and particularly bad faith among the middle class, African-Americans and, and white Jews alike. And there was a sense in which I think, you know, we have sort of, you know, bought into this idea of the American dream and that if you work hard, if you sort of, you know, adopt the master sort of language and tools, if you learn how to manipulate the system, right, you can actually make it work for you. And I think for African-Americans in particular, we recognize that there's been a, a real cost to trying to manipulate that system in part because we failed to recognize or really we failed to come to a, kind of a startling reality that as Alicia Garza had recently reminded us that the system was was designed to operate in this way. And so for us to actually, you know, use words like equality, you know, equity um, and justice, we have to embrace this idea that we were never meant to survive. And what does that mean, particularly for African Americans and for Jews, right, with this long history of persecution, of, you know, otherizing and marginalization. And so for this moment, I have been trying to rethink along with sort of my, my community in terms of my family, in terms of my students, how do we come to terms with a past that did not intend for us to survive? And then once we reckon with that, what does it mean to, re how do we respond? And I appreciate Dean Pierce's comments because I'll be frank, I emailed a former student and said, you know, I'm just, I've really lost hope because this moment with the passing of Ginsburg it's just a reminder of how there's been so much death. And it's very interesting given how we claim as a nation to, to buy into all kinds of faith that we have yet to recognize how to mourn and to mourn both as a public and to deal with how this year has been a huge loss for so many people. And so, you know, to sort of bring this back together, I'm really trying to think through this idea of how do we compel people who are in positions of power to recognize the depths of this history and to force us, right, to push the system because we we see how other people are using their bodies, they're protesting, they're screaming, they're making it possible for us to have this luxury of this conversation, to sit in our classrooms. And now I think we have a, a different kind of responsibility, of course, to join them, but also to figure out how do we come to tr come to truth with this sort of system we, we've inherited, but then also how do we respond to in a way that's sort of ethic ethically, that's ethically oriented, but also speaks to the hope that Dean Pierce um, so eloquently reminded us of. Well, and I, I think that uh, I can say this, and I know that uh, Cornell probably feels this as well. Our college students keep us on our toes and keep us our moral compass in the right direction. Um, Rabbi Shankman and I both have daughters who are on the campus. Cornell has a son on the campus. Jacques does as well. Um, and uh, I want to share with you a quote that I first got from my own son. Uh, Sue's going to put it up on the screen, uh, making it a little larger, I hope. Um, I'm going to read it to you uh, for those of you who don't have uh, young eyes, but eyes like mine. It, this is from uh, Jelani Cobb. He wrote it in the New Yorker. Race to the degree that rep race to the degree that it represents anything coherent in the United States is shorthand for a specific set of probabilities. The inequalities between black and white Americas are documented in rates of morbidity, in infant mortality, wealth, and unemployment, which attests that although race may be a biological fiction, its reality is seen in what is likely to happen in our lives. The more than 40 million people of African descent who live in the United States recognize this reality but is largely invisible in the lives of white Americans. As with men who upon seeing the scroll of Me Too testimonies, ask their wives, daughters, sisters, and coworkers, is it really that bad? The shock of revelation that attended the video of Floyd's death is itself a kind of inequality, a barometer to the extent to which one group of Americans 
have moved through life largely free from the burden of such terrible knowledge, end quote. We, we shared this the other day, and uh, we'll put it into the chat for those of you, but I want to I want to start first because I know he's going to have to jump off very soon with Mark Thomas. How did Reverend Thomas, how does this resonate for you? Because you spoke eloquently a, a week ago Friday about this. I have this thing in the church that I pastor um, about uh, things that black people um, all equate almost with scripture. They're, they're anecdotes, is uh, colloquialisms but this right up in this things that we have to incorporate in, into our lives. And one of them is, if I got to tell you, you don't need to know. <laughs> That's very colloquially speaking. That's, um, so what it becomes amazingly frustrating. Um, and, and you and I have talked about this. We, we know your history. We, we know the history of of America. We know what's taught in the textbooks. And then when I got to Howard University, everything that I ever learned about history, about Columbus, I get to Howard, they said he was lost. Um, they tell us about the mutiny. That's not stuff they teach us in high school. But then we learn the other side. And then when we learn the other side and we're armed with this, this duality in our education, what happens is is that it becomes frustrating when our friends, our colleagues, our, our loved ones that just so happen not to look like us don't even want to consider that there is an alternate uh, side or alternate reality to our reality. So the, white, the all lives matter is a knee-jerk reaction to black lives matter. The two couldn't be farther away from being congruent. And it is, it becomes tone deaf, it becomes painful. And it is a pain that African Americans get used to living with. Um, uh, in a little different context, uh, I think it was Benjamin Elijah Mays who talked about the black tax, things we got to do that other folks don't have to do. And you can also ascribe that black pain we live with that pain constantly with the, uh, I think someone said it earlier, that pressure. And you don't know what that pressure is like until we have conversations like this, as, as, as we, I think I talked about last week, when I go into a store, there is a clock that goes off in my head as to how long I can be in there before somebody is assuming that I'm stealing something or somebody's going to follow me, or somebody's going to come next to me and start adjusting um, the clothing and then ask me if I need help, as opposed to ask me when I need help uh, as soon as I walk in the door. So um, th that's, that's the reality that we live with. And I just, I just want America, America that doesn't look like me. I want America to sit down and to listen, which is why I applaud you, Rabbi, for having these conversations, because in conversations, that's how we grow and that's how we learn, and uh, that's how God helps to make changes in us. So thank you. I want to, well, thank you, and I know, Mark, you're going to have to jump on and jump off and feel free, and thank you so much, and we're so delighted that Conti is going to be one of our partners in conversation so that we can all grow together. Cornell, um, I want you to talk a minute, or when I ask you about this, uh, when I was dragged by somebody uh, to a high school near Selma, uh, sleeping uh, in a in a in a gymnasium, uh, and when I was pleading for some of the good food that you had been served, and I was sweet talking to cooks, um, I overheard one of the people walking in the march talking to her son. I think I told you the story, and it caught my ear because she was saying to her husband, "How did you let Marcus and my son's name is Marcus take the car?" And she was desperate. This is a woman who had served in the the Air Force, and she was up leading cheers at the front of thing. She was a, a, had been a CEO at, um, at um, Deloitte, um, an incredibly talented one, and she was terrified. What terrified her? Her, spot, her husband had let her son take her car out, which she and he knew had a broken taillight. All of a sudden, I realized I lived, and my Marcus lived in a different America. How do we reconcile this? What does this quote from Cobb mean to you, Court? 
Yeah. So um, I remember that um, that story well, uh, both you telling it, but also the woman who told it. it, it American history represents um, serial racial denial of irrefutable, empirical, qualitative, quantitative historical evidence of its own racism, which is to say uh, black families, what is a lived reality is also known by white people. Here's what I'm saying. So George Floyd being uh, killed this summer, most Americans don't necessarily know this as a matter of statistics, but they know intuitively or they sense intuitively or should sense intu intuitively um, that black people are three times more likely to be killed by the police. Uh, young African-American men are six times more likely to be killed, excuse me, uh, uh, 21 times more likely to be killed by the police, such that the leading cause, police homicide is the sixth leading cause of death. When we look at the statistics related to housing discrimination, the home ownership gap, uh, the uh, Jelani Cobb notes infant mortality, uh, the ways in which literally black women and black children die in childbirth. These statistics are well known among, yes, social scientists, but there's an intuitive sense in this country that things are not right, that people are treated, are not treated fairly. And how do we know this? Every, every time there's a story about a, a white person who pretends to be black, white America is shocked, right? Rachel Dolezal was all about white America being shocked at any any reasonable, rational white person would ever want to be black, right? So these stories that, that you, you, you read about the, 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 the notion that black lives are really dangerous lives, vulnerable lives. White people sense this intuitively, but this is categorical denial again and again and again. The dean alluded to this. So uh, George Floyd, uh, is another version of Jamar Clark, another version of, of Lando Castile, another version of Michael Brown, another version of Sandra Bland. The point being here is we see these tragedies playing out again and again, but the serial denials playing out again and again. And what America believes is not evidence, but disruption, mm -hmm. right? So when young people take to the streets and disrupt the status quo, the status quo, they, they derail the status quo, they interrupt our lives, we tend to believe that as opposed to the experiential, empirical, qualitative, quantitative evidence in hidden in plain sight. And so for us as people of faith, our challenge is to make the moral case that there is a difference. And we have to make the empirical case, the qualitative case, the quantitative case, but ultimately we got to disrupt, right? Because it's like we've convened a jury of our peers disbelieving. And the only way we get them to believe is we got to get their attention. And that is a unique role for people of faith. Why? Because we have credibility. We have the moral stature. Uh, we have the ability to convene. I want to note this. Washington Hebrew congregation has the ability to convene. People listen to, and Bruce didn't pay, didn't pay me to say this, but I know this. People listen to your rabbi. They respect you. And to the extent that you're able to bring people together who prefer not to be together, who don't want to talk together, that's power. That's incredible power. And so my response to Jelani Cobb's literally distillation, summarization, and statement of what is, uh, 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 should be uh, uh, apparently obvious, is that we've got to take what is known make it known to others and compel them to listen to it and respond. Um, I'm, I'm, I know Yolanda wants to respond. Uh, Dean, what were you gonna say? So this conversation is so rich for me because one of the things I just also want to put on the table with everything that my colleagues have already said is that the way that this country often responds is that they see or watch the video of or hear about an explicit act of violence. And that act of violence might then galvanize people to do some work. 
What I want to suggest for us as people of faith is a different way. And, and it is to say this, that there are acts of violence that have nothing to do with being beaten by a police officer. And the way that we fail to understand how African Americans systematically face acts of violence, it is actually an act of violence to prevent people from voting. The political disenfranchisement, those are acts of violence. These disproportionate rates of Black infant mortality, those are acts of violence. And so it's important for me to just jump in um, where, where Dr. Uh, my, my dear colleague just stopped to simply say that because if the only thing that galvanizes us is because someone takes a grainy video of someone being beaten, which we know is consistent with 400 years of history, and we fail to see the ways in which every day, quotidian, day after day, acts of violence brutalize people's spirits and psyches, that's where we as people of faith mm -hmm really have to have a part. People's psyches, their spirits, their emotions, their minds are being brutalized by this system of American racism. And it doesn't make for good video, but I absolutely have to interrupt the conversation to say that, that we're talking about systems and forces and powers and principalities, and they're not always going to be caught on tape, and they're not always about a police officer's foot on someone's neck. But the way that we prevent returning citizens from voting, the ways in which we gerrymander certain of our districts to keep people from voting, the way in which affordable housing works in this country, those are also acts of violence. And we as people of faith have to say, what does it mean for us to believe in God and not want to see the fracturing of people's spirits? That's our responsibility. So uh, I want to jump real quick. Uh, these are, um, I, I'm, I'm pushed by the limits of time in terms of, I'd like to turn to, to Jacques and to Terrence because uh, in the academic, if you will, ivory tower, which is not so ivory and it ain't so much a tower these days, um, I know that you have, uh, because my own child experience, I know that you have had the rawness of having uh, the, the students of Georgetown, uh, very capable intellectual students, be shocked to their core at times in trying to grapple with some of these issues in a very safe uh, environment. And um, if we move from, our, uh, from the sense of understanding, what have the two of you learned in the classroom? Because I, in reading you know, the parts of your book, I think there's much richness. Uh, you've talked about the, you know, the mythology of our relationships, the, 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 the elements that we have to, you know, Terrence just spoke about uh, a little bit about, uh, the, about the failure of the middle class. What are some of the things that, can, that at this moment you think and what you've learned from our experience might move us f forward? Because we're looking for more than quote unquote the book club. We're looking more from than the putting the chairs together in the bottom of the church or in the synagogue and having the nice, you know, get together in terms of we're we we want to talk about what everybody's talking about. How do we affect substantive change? And part of that in what for all of our face has got to be education. And you guys have been doing that. So what is your thoughts? Either Terrence or Jacques, whoever wants to jump in, or both, please. And uh, I'll start first and just, just to, uh, I, I think, um, contextualize part of what my colleagues have said. Part of the issue is that I think in too many cases, we assume that the other, as in white folk, actually see and hear black people. Um, you know, I keep going back to Du Bois's The Negro Problem, this idea that people see African Americans as inherently de devoid of morality, devoid of a soul. And so, you know, even if you were to pinch me and say, ouch, people are surprised. Like, oh, we didn't know you actually feel pain. So even when people know about or hear these stats, it's, it's as if they don't actually hear the stats or they don't actually see us. So part of the issue becomes, you know, do you want to continue exerting efforts to try to get people to see you? Um, and so within the classroom, what's been really, really telling is this idea that most of our kids don't talk to each other. I mean, even in a so-called safe space like Georgetown, folk live in their own, their own silos. And so 
we find that people come to the classroom for a different reason. You know, black folk want to learn about black history or, or the white Jews want to come in and learn about, you know, so, you know, Judaism, but no one quite gets the connection. And so once they see the connection and, and, and sort of see a kind of quote common enemy in terms of the ways in which white Christianity, right, has sort of pushed anti-Semitism, anti-blackness, then we were kind of left at an impasse because, because they don't have a prior relationship, because they've grown up in very different kinds of communities, we have been a difficult time trying to bring them together. And so the only way that we have witnessed, right, a kind of coalition is when we see folk joining BLM. Um, that has become one entry point. And clearly that is a whole nother conversation, particularly for many within the Jewish community. And so, you know, I don't have a real answer in terms of what to actually do, but I do think we should, you know, indict universities because we haven't done a great job in really fostering this kind of relationship. Again, um, in part because we have lied for so long that this is a safe space. It has not been a safe space. And so Jacques and I have been attempting to, to try to, you know, break some of these barriers, but it's, again, it's difficult because we're trying to undo 18, 20 years worth of, of segregation. I mean, for many people, they've never had a black woman teacher. Only black people, people of color they know are their nannies or, or people who take care of their house, like, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the gardeners. And so trying to kind of push back against that, then on top of that, to bring in this whole history of blacks and Jews, it's overwhelming. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think we have a real tall challenge. And, you know, my fear is that because so many of, of, of this generation are turning away from institutionalized religion, I think our challenge is even, even greater. Yeah. You're muted, man. There we go. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, I just want to be really quick because we've got so many great thinkers here. We've got academics, we've got clergy. So I'm, I'm going to say this very, very quickly. I think the project going forward, it's two projects, right? The, uh, you hear Professor Johnson using the term white Jews, and I, I think we have to get used to using that term if only as a bridge uh, to a more robust sense of Jewish identity. So I'm going to use it as well. I think there needs to be an inner conversation in the white Jewish community in the United States. And we need to ask some very, very difficult questions. So it won't be a book club, Rabbi. Uh, you and I have discussed this sort of thing. Uh, one thing that, that stunned Professor Johnson and I, like, what did you learn from this project? We've been teaching this for five years, but we only started writing about six months ago. Here's one thing we learned, right? We were both puzzled by Southern Judaism. All right. There was a lot about Southern Judaism that for whatever reasons in our first four years working together on these issues, we hadn't worked through. And this all came together when we had the great Susanna Heschel. We all know her dad. We did an interview with her and she was talking about the famous image of John Lewis crossing the bridge. And there's a sign off in the back that says Teppers. Right. And um, Professor Heschel was telling us who Tepper was. Tepper was a, a, a Jewish American and a member of the white Citizens Council. All right, now, does that mean most Jews were like that? Absolutely not. Was Tepper an outlier? Most likely he was an outlier. However, I feel that those types of difficult conversations, Rabbi, as we move forward as a congregation, as we have all these great interlocutors, we have the Dean of the Divinity School of Howard University here. I mean, we couldn't ask, right, for a better set of people to speak to. Um, I think we internally, as so-called white Jews, I think we need to look through our history and we have to ask ourselves these really difficult questions and doing it in the company of our African-American colleagues, be they Jewish or not, is going to be a huge boon to us if they'd be so kind to assist us in that conversation. And I feel once we begin having that dialogue internally in our Jewish congregations, especially one like WHC, I feel we're going to very clearly see what the next steps are. All right, the next steps are going to become extremely transparent to us. Like, oh, this is what we need to do now that we understand this about ourselves, now that we understand some of the errors we made and some of the great things we did as well. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you. And as I told, uh, I told Jacques and just parenthetically, Saul Tepper, who is actually a transplanted New Yorker who came to Selma, was the first vice president of the first my first uh, congregation who gave me a key to the city from Joe Smitherman, uh, who I couldn't believe, who was the head of the White Citizens Council and then was the mayor of Selma. So uh, it's a, some of the times identity uh, and the things, the prices that people play, uh, uh, pay for acceptance uh, and the lengths that they will go are, uh, are detrimental to all.
Speaking of that and talking about the, the richer and broader sense of this, I want to turn to you, Dr. Pierce, um, because, you know, you're the first woman to be the uh, head of the Howard Divinity School, which we congratulate you because they couldn't have made a better choice, uh, having seen you on action in the Mayor's Citizens Council and uh, other things. Uh, it's a great choice. But I, there's even within, a, when we talk about a conversation within the Jewish community, we also need to take about, have a conversation, I believe, about uh, the way things that are uh, portrayed in some ways, because um, as we begin to look at this, um, I guess it was Kimberly Crenshaw, when she does her presentation on intersexuality, intersexuality and um, intersectionality, and when she does that, she asks her audience uh, names of people and they all recognize the names of the African-American, the black men in America who've been killed. But strikingly, they do not know the violence that has happened to black women in America. As a woman, as a, the dean, what can we learn from what Crenshaw is telling us? So thank you so much, Rabbi, for that great uh, question. It is back to what I was saying earlier about what do we think about when we think about violence? What do we think about when we think about racism? And so many years in the classroom, um, the years that I taught at a large Southern university, the students would respond, well, the Klan or someone calling you the N word or police brutality, right? Without sitting with the systematic ways that both microaggressions as well as larger acts of violence are enacted upon people's bodies. And that, of course, includes Black women. So recently, of course, we've had the case of a Breonna Taylor who has been in the news, the police officers who had a no knock warrant who came and to her home where she was sleeping and she was killed. Um, and, and absolutely, it's necessary to lift up those cases. But I also want us to lift up cases where, for instance, we can look at our public school system and see that young African-American girls are seven times more likely to be suspended for certain kinds of behavior, right? So that what we have to do and train ourselves to do is say that these forces that we are talking about don't just enact themselves in ways that are public, but a lot of times enact themselves in ways that are in the private sphere. So when you have college educated black women dying of childbirth at three times the rate as college educated white women, that tells you that something is broken in the way in which we have done race and medicine in this country. And it's not the news that makes the, the it's not the story that makes the news, right? But it is a reality of black women's lives. And so when we talk about intersectionality, we're talking about how gender expression and race and um, one sexual orientation and uh, all of these components, poverty, um, the plight that poor Black women face. Right now, dealing with COVID, our nation, including our own city, have said certain workers are essential and others are not. But the reality is that we treat some workers as disposable, and those workers tend to be people of color, and they tend to be women, right? And so the disposable workers at the grocery store or delivering the food. So we have to shift our language and our conversation of how we are understanding what it means to do the work of justice, because if in fact the Latina woman or the black woman who works at the, the local target or who works at our giant, if there's no justice for her, then, then justice does not exist. We have to start with the least of these. Our calling is to the people who are the least of these. Susan? So uh, uh, Reverend Thomas had to go and one of the questions that I, I was going to pose to him We've had this conversation. He and I are the same age. Well, he's 50 and 51. And the fact that um, our, our experiences are, are so different in, in many ways. And uh, I know he mentioned when we were speaking last week, he talked about the fact, and the, the fact that we live in two Americas. And, um, and he talked about what it means to come into one America, but for others not to go into the other America. Um, and if we do indeed live in two Americas, 
wondering how, and I know there are others who are, are wondering the same thing, how can we bridge that gap? How can we bridge that divide? How do we create one America? What do we need to do to be able to, to do that, achieve that? That's what one, many of us are, are really wondering. Um, and Mark said, you know, come, come to us, come to my community. Um, and that's so important. And I think that figuring out how do we not just show up, but how do we show up in the places and the communities where we need to be? Um, many wait for an invitation, but, but really, how do we bridge that divide? As I uh, indicated at the outset, I believe that we are uh, in the midst of a democratically uh, genesis moment in this country, which is really about changing our sense of identity, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's another founding, and it's a founding predicated on radically changing our identity in terms of who we see ourselves to be. So in other words, it's not a matter of inviting folks from the other America into your mother, your America, but it's like reconceptualizing who we deem to be Americans so that when we uh, bring people together, it's like literally calling the family home. And so let me, let me uh, invoke the scholar that uh, Rabbi Lustig did and the Dean did, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. Namely, when we talk about intersectionality in terms of race, gender, uh, gender identity, ethnicity, uh, class, we often talk about intersectionality with respect to injustice, not intersectionality with respect to identity. Intersectionality with respect to the ways in which people are disempowered, disenfranchised, and marginalized, not the ways in which people are empowered, not the ways in which they uh, identify themselves in a way that is expansive. And so fundamentally, it comes down to how we uh, define ourselves, right? So is Washington Hebrew uh, congregation a congregation of white Jews? I think not, right? Uh, is Washington Hebrew congregation a uh, congregation that is a moral community for the Jewish community only? Uh, I, as a Methodist, um, think not. I think that you're, you're too important. Your role is too critical. Uh, you're too essential. Uh, to the life of Washington in the country at large. And so this is really a matter of a radical reconception of, of who we are. Our second point here is, um, and I, I wanna go to, to something that the Dean said, said in terms of um, uh, systemic racism and uh, violence. Violence is simply the visible metaphor for systemic racism. So when we have an act of violence that catalyzes the country, that calls us and compels us to start inviting other people into our congregation and to go and be allies to other congregations in other communities, it's as a consequence of a violent act. But in which um, there's visible violence and less visible violence. And what I'm simply saying here is the systemic violence that plays out on a day-to-day -day basis across so many sectors of American life literally call out to us. But the point I want to make, practically speaking, practically speaking, is literally when our communities of faith, when the, I'm, I'm a fourth-generation minister in the AME Church, when we start thinking of ourselves as African Methodists, as Christians, as members of a community of faith, but more importantly, the moral center of the country, right? We are the people who help, have to help this republic figure out who we are, okay? Uh, and then uh, last point here, and, and the best, best example of this, is I, I run a, a clinic in which we are examining and working on the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and police brutality. Mm. Understanding that COVID-19 is a virus, right? But police brutality is also a virus. The two are connected by systemic racism. And the degree to which we recognize that, that the elderly people dying in our nursing homes are our brothers and sisters. The folks being shot in the street are our brothers and sisters. The Native Americans dying on reservations as a consequence of COVID-19 are our brothers and sisters. Radically re reconceptualizing who we see as a part of our congregations, as a part of our moral identity, as a part of who, uh, as who we are as Americans. It, it begins with that. Because the thing is, if you literally see other people as essential to who you are, this notion of being white and Jewish and being somehow distant from somebody else uh, is foreign to you. 
and, and to get to uh, the professor's point in terms of the black middle class. When the black middle class sees the so-called underclass, uh, other folks who uh, are not a member of Jack and Jill, not a member of the Boule, not a member of our fraternities and sororities as essential to who they are, part of who they are, then they can, literally cannot walk away from them. They can't abandon them. They can't say that other people get shot, we don't get shot. Jacques, you had a comment. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, I just want to, um, so we were speaking about going backwards a little bit and learning from Jewish history. One thing I want to put on the table, I'm reading the comments and there's this tremendous thirst for texts. Where can I read about this stuff? And if there's one thing Professor Johnson and I are really good with, it's <laughs> bibliography. It's like our only saving grace. Or we, we have lots of bibliography, as does the Dean. So I'm going to mention two texts very quickly. Clive Webb, Fight Against Fear, Southern Jews and Black Civil Rights, and Lawrence Harmon and Hillel Levine, The Death of an American Jewish Community. That's about Mattapan, Boston. One's mm -hmm. about the South, one's about the North in the era of so-called desegregation. Let me tell you what's really interesting about this. The rabbis in both studies were way out ahead of their congregations. So I want the 180 people on this call, those of you who are members of WHC, to think about what I'm saying. Because if you look at Rabbi Shankman and you look at Rabbi Lustig, I'm going to invoke the great jazz saxophonist Sonny Rollins, who was talking about John Coltrane. He kept saying, he's cool. He's cool. I was watching this wonderful documentary. He's cool. Right? I was wondering, why, why did he say that four times? Right? He's cool. These cats, these rabbis are cool. All right? They have their hearts in the right places. But what American Jewish history teaches us, my fellow congregants, is often the congregations pull against the rabbis. And I just want to put that out there because this is the first of our conversations. I know it's not Yom Kippur, where we can have this in a different key, if you will. But this is one finding that you'll notice if you look at Jewish American history, that the scholars and the rabbis are in one place and the rank and file are someplace else. And I think this is something that we're all gonna have to think about as a congregation. I wanna throw it over to Professor Johnson very quickly, if I can, Rabbi. Maybe he has something to add from our classroom conversations. Professor Johnson? Yeah, no, I just wanted to add, you know, I was thinking about Audre Lorde again, this whole idea of how do we create a new language around difference? And, you know, I, I want to put on the table this idea, we have many Americas and we should embrace the many Americas. And part of the issues I think that we are discovering, say, even with Burgerfell in terms of, you know, same-sex marriage is that, you know, folk realizing that, yes, we have welcomed in so-called difference, but we welcome into a table, a pre-existing table. And part of the issue is that we don't, we, we say we want difference, but then when they come, they're loud or they, or they may wear different clothing or they're quiet. And so what I'm trying to work through this whole idea, well, how do we actually have this so-called radical difference that allows the actual table to get destroyed or reinvented, reimagined? And that's where I think we are. Is like, how do we imagine this kind of democratic society in light of very brutal and ongoing violence as Dean Peirce mentioned? And uh, Pierce mentioned, excuse me. And I think part has to do with a new vocabulary. Right, right now, so many people are feeling, white folk feel as if with BLM, there's a sense of loss. And I'm talking with students who are working with um, Democratic senators running for re-election in Michigan, Indiana, and, and this is what they're hearing. Uh, I heard a report last night where the, a lot of Latinx men are saying, well, I may vote for Trump because I hear that Biden is a socialist. And if he gets in the office, he's just gonna give all, the things, all these things to black folk. And so there are these existing narratives that as we actually expand, that somehow we're taking something away. And I think turning to, and I haven't read uh, Pierce's book yet, but turning to black women as scholars, right? And, and to black women in terms of how they have imagined theology, it has always been about how do you actually go into the text and open it up? It's never been about how do you go in the text and let's make it tighter so fewer people can get in. And when you look at the Exodus narrative, it was about, no, we're not taking this from the Jewish people. We actually, we see God's promise in the story. We're not the, the, the elect, but we see God's promise. So how then do we take that example and expand the story? So that we see democracy and freedom as about expansion, not taking things away from people. This is these these are really important uh, comments, and I I'm so appreciative of uh, of what you said. And I you know I asked the question specifically to uh, Dr. Pierce, and I know this from Rabbi Shankman, and I asked this about uh, Black women in America because if you want to talk about living in two worlds, um, there's no woman that has not stepped into the academic world, the business world or the world of the clergy that doesn't understand that uh, 
what you're just talking about, Terrence. The table has already been set. And if you don't eat with the knife and fork that's there for a little while, um, but I'm talking now about how do we restructure? Because what I'm interested in is that new language and that new restructuring. And um, I'm, look, I'm at the end of my career, I'm sure, because uh, I've gotten a lot braver uh, on a lot of things. And I want to have this conversation. When I text to, to Cornell and I text to uh, Shiloh Baptist minister, uh, Wallace Charles Smith, who I've known for years, he was down in Nashville. And when I talk to I can't live as a Jew. I can't go to Yom Kippur after seeing what I've said, whether the chauffeur woke me up or George Floyd or whatever. We can't go forward unless we make some effort to move forward. And one of the things that stands in our way is what, you know, look, we had two women in our congregation who learned from Jacques this summer who were inspired, one in our congregation, another, and Sue will tell you about that a little bit later. But I want to ask a, a challenging question. I'm going to start with Cornell on this, and I'd like all of you to jump in. Black Lives Matter. Is it a political movement? Does the platform and the things that are written in actually matter to the majority of African Americans? And how does the African American community react to the hypersensitivity and the particularism that happens when people are dying and everybody's concern is, is that there's so many lines about Palestinian liberation. How does that feel? What does that do to either bridge or to create a distant distance? And I'm not, I'm making no comment on Zionism. I'm making a comment on the fact, listen, I've railed against the, uh, the president, uh, against administrations in, uh, in Israel far more than any African American has ever, I guarantee you. You read what I've written, and if you've heard what I've said, I have more problems and look for justice. So the question is, how do we create this thing when, when we can't stand if somebody else might be doing something to us or might creating something or it might be seen as anti-Semitism or anti-Israel? How do we bridge this gap? Cornell, mm -hmm. and then all of you jump in because that's the crux is because when we put up a Black Lives Matter sign, because there is no other sign that matters, you know? I can't put up all lives matter because all lives do matter or we're created in the image of God. Right now, the sign is black lives matter because that's what's on the conscience of America. Yeah. So let me, let me, let I'm me. I'm not passionate about this at all, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, 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 I so appreciate the, the question. And if I can just um, ask the congregation just extend to me a, 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 a the space for candor, right? So I said from your Bema in your house that Black Lives Matter is the moral predicate to the ethical conclusion that all lives matter. Unless the first is true, the second can never be true. And so the point that I'm trying to make here, and I, I want to be candid. When people say, uh, as in non-African Americans, well, Black Lives Matter is anti-Israel, it's anti-this, it's anti-that, it's often seen, that argument is seen as beside the point. Not beside the point in, in the sense that people are not concerned about Israel, not concerned about Palestine, but when people are literally grieving over the latest hashtag, the latest police homicide, along with all the attendant less visible violence that comes about as a consequence of systemic racism, to have any other conversation seems beside the point. Not that people are not concerned, but I can just tell you this. As the 18th president of the, of, of the NAACP, I can recall going into Ferguson, going into Minneapolis, Baton Rouge, Charleston. And one of the things I, I noticed as the presidency of the NAACP, when somebody's been shot, don't go in talking about policy. Don't go in talking about uh, police reform. Don't go in talking about uh, 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 qualified immunity or police cameras. You want to speak to grief. You want to speak to our shared humanity. You want to speak from a point of compassion. So putting in front of your congregation, Black Lives Matter, those three words are simply emblematic of being concerned about the Imago Dei, the, the 
the fact that black people are created like Jewish people in the image of God. And so the point being here is, let's be clear about this. When you look at the breadth and the diversity of the black community, it is not encapsulated uh, in Black Lives Matter. <laughs> black Lives Matter is an more emerging philosophy, it's a symbol, it's a metaphor, but it is not a coherent political platform for every black person in America. And so the point being here is you can embrace the cardinal tenet that Black Lives Matter, the Imago Dei, people are created in, in, in the image of God, and debate various provisions of Black Lives Matter platform. And here's what I noticed. When I went and spoke from your pulpit, what I heard in response to the words we shared was, a, was an affirmation of Black Lives Matter. Now, the point being here is this is not about philosophy. It's about text. It's not about uh, a slogan or a hashtag. It's about scripture. And so the, in response to, to the rabbi's question, um, just be clear. Putting a sign or a placard out in front of the congregation is a great symbolic a statement of support. It is by no means a distillation of a coherent philosophy um, put on, uh, on, on some kind of placard. And I, I note this because I know your congregation has done a whole lot more than simply put out a sign. The sign is the least of what you've done. Anybody else, Professor, uh, Dr. Pierce? So I simply wanted to respond with, we all, all of us, um, myself included, have to think about the assumptions that come to bear when we think about Black Lives Matter. And I say that because um, as someone who, like Dr. Brooks, I went to Ferguson and I went in my role as a clergy person and I had been hearing from so many people about, well, the success of the civil rights movement was in part at least due to the fact that it was led by religious leaders, right? So we have a number of religious leaders, not just King, but, but rabbis, people from all over who were a formative part of of the civil rights movement. And so Black Lives Matter doesn't have a spiritual core. It's not religious. It doesn't have leaders. And so therefore, it is not ever going to succeed. I went to Ferguson um, after the death of Michael Brown. And I went with my set of assumptions. I went as a person who has been teaching theology for her academic career. And I talked to some 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds. And what I heard from them, Rabbi, I heard from them was a profound spirituality that may not fit a particular religion or a particular faith, but was a profound spirituality that they felt that their lives had a cause, that they were out there marching and protesting day after day in the heat. It was so hot. They, they were there day after day because that's where they believed that God needed them. And I, I tell you all that story to simply say that anywhere that people are showing up because they truly believe that God is calling them and that there is work to be done and that they have a spiritual vocation, that's a place I want to be. It doesn't mean I always have to agree with it. It doesn't mean that the policies and, and all of the bylaws, and, it, it, they might not even be present. But I wanna show up where people who believe in God, believe that God calls us to work. And so I want us to be patient with whatever Black Lives Matter may be. It might be, not be the organizations that we are accustomed to. It might not have the, the kinds of rules and regulations and structures and hierarchies that we are used to. But if in fact people are showing up because God calls us, commands us to do justice. That's not, it wasn't an option. We are command, commanded to do justice. Then that's a place I wanna show up. And that's a place that I have to listen. And it's a place where I learn to humble myself and say, I have more to learn from these 17 year olds and their faithfulness of coming out every day because I recognize my own lack of faithfulness in my life because sometimes I don't show up. So I'm saying that I think that there are moments, right? Um, and there are particular moments in history where if we are humble, we might learn more than we think that we know. 
Well, I, this conversation has been incredibly humbling for me, and I want to turn uh, real quick and ask uh, Rabbi Shankman, and then I want to get some concluding remarks. Uh, Rabbi Shankman, tell a little bit about how uh, she and I have spent our summer and some of, uh, uh, when I didn't give her a chance to say what this moment means, and I think if she tells you a little bit, it'll explain that. Sue, I mean, Rabbi Shankman. Same, same person. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think part of it is that uh, certainly earlier on, I, it was important, it, it is important for, for me to listen. As the saying goes, God gave us two ears and one mouth so that we might listen more than we speak. And, and now is certainly a moment to listen and hear what's needed. And, uh, and from over the past months, that's, that's been what, I, what I've been doing. And we've talked about, you know, all the books, which I have, not just for show, but because it's important to know and understand and, and to be able to come to the table and have the conversation and ask the, the difficult questions, which is what we've been doing um, this summer. Uh, a few quick things that have been going on is um, back in, in May, I believe it was, in my community, my area of Potomac, a number of neighbors got together. They started a Facebook group. They said, let's just meet for a vigil. People were concerned with the virus. They didn't want to go downtown. They wanted to be in the tower venue and um, and out of that grassroots you know a neighborhood and a community that's already been together but really has started to to stand up and many of our own congregants were part of that and so we we also use that energy and harness that energy uh, my husband's a rabbi at the religious action center of reform judaism and they've been part of this we've been part of this postcard collective uh trying to get out the vote and um and a number of our congregants wanted to do something and that was something, that was a way people could literally hands-on do, do something that was going to affect change. Uh, but the other bigger piece I think that's been going on is that um, Rabbi Lustig and I were approached by a congregant, Karen Heron, who is, who is part of this conversation. She's on here today. Uh, and she, along with a friend, uh, Marla Schulman, actually I, they may have met in Jacques' class uh, that he taught um, this winter on, on Black Jewish relations at Washington Hebrew, and they started talking. Uh, Marla is the, the immediate past president of B'nai Israel, a conservative congregation in Montgomery County, two large congregations, mainstream, and they started talking about what, what can we do? So they both brought in their rabbis, so we've been talking, Rabbi Lustig and I, along with Rabbi Safra and Rabbi Berkowitz of B'nai Israel, and with Marla and with Karen, and started thinking about what how, how can we use this moment as an opportunity, not just to learn, but to take action? And at the same time, we also have a, um, a racial equity task force that we started at Washington Hebrew. Kathy and Mark Shineson, as mentioned earlier, are the, the co-chairs of that, because we also need to do that work internally. And, and, and part of it is how do we do this internally, which uh, I believe Rabbi Lusk is gonna speak to, or I can as well, about what we're going to spend this next year doing. Um, it's, it's about, moving forward. And some of that is the, the learning that happens along the way, but it's also about conversations like this. This is not a, a Rosh Hashanah conversation only. This is a conversation that needs to happen every day. And we need to figure out ways to be having this conversation both among those on this call, but also with others in the community. And, uh, and we need to show up and we need to be present. And so we're going to be having a, uh, a cohort for this racial equity roundtable, as we're calling it, between Washington Hebrew congregation and B'nai Israel congregation, and uh, we are um, we're going to be having people who are going to go through training, and uh, and learn not just about the issues surrounding racial equity and justice in this country, but also how to move forward. What how we can? I know a number of people asked in the chat, what can we do? And this is not just about learning, it's about doing. That's what Judaism teaches us. We should, we should pray as if everything depends upon God, but we should act as if everything depends upon us. Uh, so that's also what we're going to be doing, uh, not only with B'nai Israel congregation, but also even more importantly, or, or equally as important, within Washington Hebrew congregation as part of our congregational conversation this year, which I believe Rabbi Lustig wants to to share sure. and speak about. I, I want to, uh, first I want to thank everybody. And uh, Sue was involved. She's being a little bit modest. We, we went through, we interviewed every group that we could find that has been doing uh, uh, racial equality work and community organizing 
Uh, we did that with a, as a group of rabbis and lay leaders. Uh, we interviewed, we then called constituent groups that were working with them and rabbis and ministers that were working with them, trying to go through and find out what could be the best way. And part of the reason we wanted to do this with uh, out is that Montgomery County is very different. And we have, we're in both Montgomery County and in uh, the District of Columbia. And our relations with African Americans in uh, the district is far different than it is in uh, the county. And the county is uh, 126 languages just in the public schools are spoken by the students. And yet it is diverse in that way, but is lily white in other ways. So how do we as white Jews in the suburbs you know, bridge these gaps and create what we've created in some senses uh, in our relationships. To that end, I want to thank because I have learned so much by, uh, by being in discussion with Jacques. I've learned a tremendous amount from uh, uh, Cornell Brooks. I've been reading the incredible work and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to share some of that with our congregation with Jacques' permission and Terrence's by the brilliant work that they put together. And I think the, their approach is, uh, I think it's going to be, it's really in my ways, it's a condensate, uh, a coalition and a, a, a way of looking this in a whole different way. Um, and we are committed for the first time ever uh, in 2000, a uh, number of years ago, uh, early on, I was upset when I came back in 2006 from Israel and I went to have a congregational conversation of what had gone on in Israel. And I couldn't in my conversation put out a word. I had people yelling two different things. The tension in our congregation over Zionism and what it meant was unbelievable. And all I could think about is how the rabbi said it wasn't going to be anybody else who was going to kill uh, the Jews. It was going to be tzinat, uh, internal hate, not being able to listen to each other. The same is true of our American democracy. If we do not learn to listen to each other, we will kill ourselves by hate and hate alone. It won't be a Russian attack. It won't be anybody subversive. It'll be our inability to live up to the ideals of our democracy. To that end, we had a conversation where we have a pledge of civility and we put small groups together after we talked. Jacques helped us with the curriculum, Stephanie Tankel, Rabbi Sklut. It was wonderful. We are doing the same thing. This year, we are going to be in conversation with Washington Hebrew with members of the Howard Divinity School, with members of Shiloh Baptist Congregation, with the members of John Wesley AME Church, and with the members of uh, Conti AME Church. And we are gonna be having a curriculum in which we will have conversations first in our own race and faith groups, and then talk about what are the difficulties, and then come together and have mixed conversations. And when this pandemic comes over, those conversations are going to take place in each other's congregation so that it's not people just coming to Washington Hebrew or Washington Hebrew just going to their congregations. So then we can begin to create a new dialogue and a new opportunity that we're not strangers to each other because we all are scared of strangers, but that we are known to each other. And that's why I was so glad when I met Yolanda Price on the and heard her speak on the mayor's advisory council i said that's a woman i gotta know because she's smarter than i am and she's gonna help us and she's been helping us so to that end i'm very delighted to say that our first conversation will begin uh, a keynote at 5 p.m we hope well it's going to happen whether the speaker will be on 5 p.m on october the 11th mark your dates and we'll all those congregations and people come together we have put out an invite and we're waiting for final affirmation to um, Isabel uh, uh, Wilkins, who has written the book, uh, Cast, uh, The Origins of Our Discontent. It is, uh, and we're going to be careful not to be sidetracked from the real issues of racism, but I think there are things in her prose that will disarm us white folks that other books don't do. Um, and uh, I think that this is going to be the beginning of a conversation. So uh, we hope that we'll be able to affirm that very soon. But we will begin. And once we have that keynote, we'll be hearing in all of our congregations. I want to thank Cornell for continuing to be my teacher. I want to thank Terrence and, uh, and uh, Jacques for all the work that they do. Rabbi Shankman for her activism. 
and to Dr. Pierce for her courage and her voice that she has had and will have and the, the place that she have come. And to all of our congregants, you already make it a sweet year. We were up to 190 some odd devices during this conversation. People have dropped in and out, I'm sure. It has been recorded and we will share that recording. But this is the beginning because we have to have a new opportunity to move forward. And I thank you all for participating. Um, I'll leave any final words. We're a little beyond our time, but uh, a sentence or two from each of you. Um, we'll start with Terrence. Uh, just great to have the conversation and really want to um, encourage folk to um, think about HU at this time. Jacques and I have been joking and saying, we gotta find a way to get over there because at this moment, we feel as if that's sort of the place uh, where something new and creative can happen. So, you know, I want us to put our heads together to figure out how, how we can make that happen. Thank you. Jacques? There we go. Thank you, Rabbi. Shana Tova to everyone. Thank you, Rabbi Shankman. Thank you, Rabbi Lustig. Thank you to all the speakers. We're all going to go tashlichin afterwards. And, you know, we let's think about these themes as we cast off our sins. Um, and the last thing I want to say, I really meant what I said speaking as a historian, though I'm not a historian, I'm a sociologist. Let's listen to our rabbis, right? The mistake that I think many Jewish American communities have made on civil rights issues is they haven't listened to really good rabbis that have skin in the game and are trying to make a change. So this is on all of us. Let's thank our rabbis and let's listen to our rabbis. Thank you, everyone. I look forward. Thank you, Jacques. Cornell? I, I can't help but note that um, with the new year, the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and uh, the passing of a, a woman, a legal pioneer who represents Jewish values, but also a woman who, when she went before the Supreme Court, her brief contained the name of an African-American woman pioneer, Polly Murray. And that brief extending the protections of, of race to women, uh, going from race to gender, represents an intersectional legal note, an intersectional moral note, but it also represents an intersectional narrative in terms of Blacks and Jews in this moment. And so uh, in the midst of these high, uh, this midst of this high holiday, I would just simply say to this wonderful, powerful congregation led by a powerful rabbi, please do not underestimate, do not underestimate the centrality of your role in this moment, right? So th this is a moment of reckoning. It's a, it's a, it's a third reconstruction and maybe a genesis of founding that at its essence, it is a moral moment. And it's a role and it's a moment that you have to speak to. And I'm simply praying that um, I can simply uh, be a part of whatever it is that you do. Thank you so much. Dr. Pierce? I just want to remind us that everyone can do this work where they are. Some people are going to protest and march and, and rally, but we need poets and we need writers and we need dancers and we need people who are creative. We need our artists. We need our thinkers. We, we, we need our, our singers. We need our cantors, right? To, it's to remind us that we all have a role in the work of justice. It was wonderful to see so many people out at the Supreme Court last night um, to celebrate the life of uh, Justice Ginsburg. But I always want to remind people that not everyone one is physically able to go somewhere. And so our artists, our writers, our thinkers, our poets, all of us, all of us have a role in this work. Don't think because you can't be where you think the action is that you are not in the right place. God has you in the right place at the right time with the right set of gifts to do the work of justice. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. I want to remind folks that uh, tonight at 8 p.m., Bend the Ark, on the steps of the Supreme Court will be holding a vigil. Um, I would like to say that um, I had the privilege of spending this summer while I was waiting for uh, the weather to clear up at uh, Jeff and Christy Weiss's farm to spend almost an hour and a half with uh, Justice Ginsburg. Uh, and we were talking about a lot of in, uh, uh, issues and um, I would dedicate that what we're doing now and this year, what we're doing to her memory 
because in so many ways she was a pioneer in so many ways. She believed in Judaism, she believed in uh, equality, she believed in civil rights, but most of all, she believed in our democracy. And it's our moral responsibility as people of faith to, to uphold and continue despite who's gonna be on the court or not be on the court. That court is representative of, of the people of, the, of this nation and the people of this nation have to speak up about what they think is morally right. So to our panelists again, to my colleague, Rabbi Shankman, thank you so much to all. Let's make it a sweet year by doing the right thing. Let's be on the right side of history and let's try to bridge the gap so that if there, at least we have a consciousness of knowing how to respond and that we can read the story of creation, which we do on Rosh Hashanah, which all are created in God's image and let us act like all are created in God's image, giving all the due respect that are needed. Thank you so much, Shana Tova.